Professor of Turkish Language and Literature at Boston University. It is truly my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adnan Onart as a speaker. He uh, received his PhD from the University of Istanbul and then continued to postdoctoral studies <coughs> at the University of Frankfurt. He has many publications in different fields from dictionaries to philosophical treaties to technological works. And for the past 10 years roughly, he's been working on Sufism. And so now he will be sharing his expertise on Anatolian Sufism with us. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. So today uh, we are going to talk about uh, a specific slice within a slice of Sufism. So if we take the Sufism is a mystical branch of Islam, rather it's uh, uh, defined. <laughs> So within it, we'll find a Turkish or Turkic kind of Sufism, which will span to Central Asia, as we are going to see. And Anatolia would be another geographical location within the Turkish culture of Sufism. And then we look at specific, very specific periods of 13th and 14th centuries. And in order to give a better feel uh, for uh, what, uh, what was the, if you like, the general thinking and feeling of the period, I'll be talking about Hacı Bektaş Veli and specifically a teaching he introduced, which is called Four Gates and Four uh, Steps, Kırkapı Kırkmakam, uh, 40 Steps or 40 uh, Hosts. And uh, based on this uh, frame, I'll be looking to, a, uh, to the work of a very famous Turkish poet of this period, Yunus Emre. And uh, uh, we'll try to uh, relate as some selected set of his po uh, poems into those uh, gates. It, uh, actually, this concept of four gates has an uh, initial form in Ahmed uh, Yesevi, another uh, Turkish poet. And, Sufi master, but uh, Central Asia. So I uh, just uh, mentioned uh, his name so that we are complete. Uh, just to set the historical and uh, geographical uh, uh, context, uh, this is at uh, 1200s uh, of uh, Anatolian uh, re uh, region. And what we see is, despite uh, uh, of all the uh, events that preceded this period, uh, crusades and uh, the, the demise of the great uh, Seljuk Empire, we see a kind of uh, a power balance. Uh, Seljuks, here called R Roman uh, Sultanate, uh, they are quite uh, still uh, alive and powerful. They can even wage some expedition to uh, Crimea against the Kupchaks. And Roman Empire, the Byzantium, is still quite uh, substantial. If we move a uh, hundred years, we see a completely different uh, scenery, power requires. Here we have this great Tihan Empire of Mughals, who are penetrating to deep in Anatolia. And as you can see, this actually boundary means not so much geographical, but in, in, in influence-wise. They are uh, dominating the, the Seljuk sultans, who are acting like vassals to them. And eastern side of the Seljuk Empire, uh, we see close to a dozen principalities, and one of them is small, maybe not contending well. Osmans will become Ottomans later on. And as you can see, Byzantium is uh, not in a good shape. So this is the period of uh, change that we are going to see the Sufi uh, thinkers we are going to get to know and poems written by Yunus Emre. So uh, there is something funny about Anatolia. This concept of four is very peculiar of it. If we go to the uh, antiquities, even the pre-Greek period, uh, three philosophers from uh, Asian coast came up with those uh, three of four elements, yeah, water, uh, air and fire, namely Thales, Anaximenes, and Heraclitus. They are all from that part. And then 
uh, Empedocles from Sicilia added the first one, earth, and thus we had uh, four uh, elements as the basis of everything, the origin and the essence. And today even I, I am told in certain coffee houses in Anatolia, would you, see, you would see some tables representing four elements. There are also some researchers who claim this. Uh, there is a special place uh, given to number four uh, in Turkic uh, culture, going to shamanism and then coming to the way uh, Ottoman administration was organized. But those are maybe coincidental, uh, if you like, uh, uh, associations. But uh, our story begins with Ahmet Yesevi, who was a Sufi master from a region of Central Asia, we call today Kazakhstan. And he wrote in uh, Turkish didactic poems, maybe not so uh, exciting from uh, aesthetic perspective, but they were uh, uh, a foundation, if you like, for bringing, making accessible the Sufi thinking to Turkish speaking people of the period. And he introduced this concept of four gates 40 steps, I call it 40 steps, makams, it may be and, uh, translated in different ways. But the point is that according to Yesevi, for a spiritual development, an individual needs to go through four gates, and he calls them shiriat, tarikat, hakikat, and marifet. And those are the Turkish term uh, he is uh, using, and we are going to get what those things are, uh, the, the actual uh, meaning translation doesn't matter. But we go uh, to Hacı Bektaş Veli, uh, where we study a little bit more closer. One uh, interesting uh, aspect is that Hacı Bektaş uh, takes the same uh, gates, but he changes the order of the last two. Instead of uh, Hakikat Marifet, he says Marifat and Hakikat. And this is this, uh, an example of his poem, and uh, where we we read that he believes there are uh, some dependencies. Uh, you cannot reach to a higher gate without going uh, through a lower gate. So Hajj Bey Tashvili, he is a uh, famous uh, uh, founder uh, of this uh, school of uh, Sufism called uh, Bektashis and. Uh, people wouldn't mention uh, the names of Bektashi without smiling if you are uh, familiar uh, with them because they have many uh, funny stories about how they are irreverent about established uh, religion, uh, traditionalists and so on. Uh, some people uh, called uh, this uh, group uh, the most legendary among all uh, Sufis uh, of the periods, but they were also very influential in the uh, uh, army, Ottoman army, Yenicheris, and uh, they uh, uh, influence uh, Balkan th uh, thinking uh, deep into uh, Albania, and in the contemporary times uh, there was Betashi uh, elements. And uh, uh, historically, some people claim that uh, a student uh, of Yesevi was uh, Betash uh, teacher, so is actually historically related. And uh, looking at his writing, I consider him what Karen Armstrong called uh, a genius of the religion. He really made a, a religion, a way of spiritual thinking, uh, revolutionized and accessible to ordinary people. And uh, as you can see, there is a controversy, uh, which means he, he was so important and Loud people try to associate him with different uh, teachers. Uh, <coughs> some try to get Ahmed Yusevi, some try to connect to Haji Bektash and uh, uh, Gökhan Arda, who himself is a Mevlevi, a follower of Rumi, wanted to see uh, Yunus Emre, and Yunus Emre actually attached uh, to Rim, uh, uh, Rumi. Yeah, I meant to talk about Yunus Emre, which we are going to see. Just to get a, a flavor of his thinking, it is Haji Bektaş Veli. Uh, I like to read some rough translations. You want this one? Yeah. Uh, from his uh, writing. 
God created mankind uh, out of four material, and he made them into four groups. Each, and each group has its own kind of prayer, its own kind of desires, and its own kind of state. As said, humans were created out of four kinds of material, first group of earth, second of fire, third from water, the fourth of wind. Uh, Actually, the order will be different, but those are the basic elements we have seen in uh, the theory of four elements. So, uh, there are some questions, of course. Uh, does he mean to say those are the essence of those people? Which means they are predestined uh, to be of a certain inclination? If we read it uh, closely, uh, that is not, I believe, the intent. He means those are like predisposition in each one of us. We have all the combination of all those elements, but maybe we have one as a predominant, and our spiritual growth will be shaped, if you like, uh, through this. And the other interesting aspect, actually, instead of air, he uses the uh, uh, wind is the fourth element, yeah, and uh, you see he is uh, interested in bringing more dynamism to this thinking, yeah. He will uh, talk about the uh, air, uh, in, we'll see why he prefers to say uh, wind rather than air. And uh, here, here is the essence of what he is up to. <coughs> this chapter, his book is called Makalat, and it is controversial even uh, whether he wrote that book and in which language. Some claims uh, it was written in Turkish and translated Arabic. We lost the original uh, Turkish, but some believes the, the original was in Turkish. In any case, what we have said something of that kind. This chapter deals with the question in how many steps a human being can reach God, whose name is magnificent, and become his friend, those. Let the world know that the created, this is cool, yeah. can reach God in 40 steps and become his friend. Uh, the interesting uh, language is that he uses this term uh, chalaptan, which is uh, not so common. Uh, we'll see in Yunus's uh, poetry also, but he doesn't say so explicitly Allah it is in the uh, examples uh, I looked at. And then he explains the steps or pause. He says, in each gate we'll have an associated ten. Ten in Sharia, ten in the others, and so on. And uh, I talk about this uh, spiritual uh, equal opportunity which I address, although we have predisposition. It sounds to me like we can find our ways, even, even if we start as a wind people to become uh, our. Uh, development uh, to the third, which is the highest. Uh, just some pictures uh, to show you that Ahmed is, uh, is uh, quite uh, important in uh, Kazakhstan. They have a uh, university and lyceum also for, under his name, and this is his mausoleum, who was, uh, that was uh, first pre, uh, constructed by uh, Tamerle. Uh, and then uh, it was declared recently to be a, a universal heritage. So those are the four uh, gates. We start with Sharia, and uh, Sharia, you may have heard, is uh, uh, the law. But in this context, it is not exactly uh, how it is meant uh, currently. It is, in my reading, a specific meaning. And the people associated with this, uh, with this gate, he calls them abyss, abyss, worshippers, and they are made of wind, so the, the uh, essence or the basis for those people is the wind. And he explains it a little bit, why he uh, considered those people to be wind people. Wind is both pure and strong. Right and wrong, edible and non-edible, are known through Sharia, because Sharia is a gate. If we can reflect a little bit on this, uh, it is pure, so Sharia is uh, under, uh, understand rules and regulations are uh, black and white, so there is no fuzziness, they are pure, 
and they are strong, so they are very strict. And they also decide not only the moral values, but also what is edible, not uh, non-edible. If you think of, in terms of uh, anthropology, uh, raw and cooked, yeah, considered uh, by some anthropologue is the basis of, of the culture. So, Sharia is a gate means it plays a, a certain role, although it may be the lowest of all the gates, but it has uh, some uh, value. The worshiping of this consists of prayers, uh, fasting, char charitable uh, donation, pilgrimage, and cleansing out of uncleanliness and forego this world by dropping the desires, since these people have a disposition towards pride and envy and stinginess and hostility. So they, those are not very good people, but uh, suppose that he has uh, the majority of uh, human species in mind. Uh, the point he is making, looking from the Islamic perspective, those are the people who are supposed to comply with the so-called uh, five pillars of the Islam. It is, he mentions four of them explicitly. So they are expected to, play, uh, to, to comply uh, with them. And uh, the way uh, we read this, uh, uh, at this stage, the spirituality is uh, fully external, ritualistic. And uh, the, we see uh, from the reading that uh, there are uh, moral shortcomings among those people, and uh, those moral shortcomings can be compensated, if you like, uh, through those uh, uh, religious uh, institutions uh, or uh, routines. So this is the lowest the gate. And then comes the second gate, which is the gate of Tarikat. Tarikat uh, uh, is the uh, lodge uh, of the, uh, a group of the uh, Soviets would form uh, a Tarikat, they said, uh, sometime called. And uh, the po uh, 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 name of the, the people at this gate are called Zahids, and uh, Zahid is also a, a uh, person name, yeah. Those are people who do not, uh, who turns their back to the uh, uh, riches of this world, and they are made of uh, fire. So the way he described it is uh, the base of this people is fire. They desire to be on fire all the time. They crave passionately for the skies. Whoever embraces the skies in this world avoids all kinds of suffering in the other. Uh, this is what they believe, those people. The worshipping uh, for uh, Tarikat people is to remember and uh, to recite uh, God's name, Zikr. Yeah. And to keep in mind, continuously, his game, and uh, to feel at the same time fear and hope. Uh, their, uh, to desire is, their desire is to be, the desire to leave the world. So if we look uh, to those people, uh, Zahids, they are a, a, a little bit higher, uh, more refined, more elevated than uh, the, the, the uh, Sharia people. Uh, but uh, they have also some uh, limitations. Uh, they, they are uh, fearful and hopeful, so th there is a balance, and their motivation is still maybe not so much uh, avoiding punishment, but going after uh, the rewards. It sounds like uh, that is the case with them. And there is an interesting uh, quote uh, from uh, Betta. She says, uh, those people have limitations because they don't know what they are coming and what they are going. God's uh, uh, gate has not been opened to them. Uh, where, where we are coming, where we are going, who we are, the, the third, uh, are the basic uh, three questions of metaphysics. So he seems to be saying those people are not so well trained trained in the deep thinking. The deep thinking comes with the marifa, yeah. And uh, the people of this gate are called Arifs. Yeah, Arif is also a very common name. And uh, those are uh, scholarly people, uh, maybe wise, and they are made of uh, water, essentially. The quote I took about uh, this is quite uh, intriguing. I like to read it. At the level of the wise ones, each word has 300 front sides and one back side. At the level of the ordinary pupil, each word has 
72 front sides and one back sides. Mm -hmm. Ignorance because of their ignorance at the back of the words and get burned. Whereas the wise one at the also the back of each word, but they stay safe and sound. I translate it in a way to, to give a flavor of his style. So it is not maybe the, the perfect English rendering, but uh, he talks about uh, the front and the back uh, of the words. And, uh, really how uh, we should understand this is a little uh, mind-boggling and there are possible interpretations. One of them, uh, those people are known uh, and this kind of Sufis making uh, the distinction between the external teaching and the internal teaching, exoterism, esoterism. So uh, the, the, the language may be also in that uh, form. Uh, there is a way you speak for the outsiders and you mean something different for the insiders. And then here uh, there is also pushing the limit of spirituality if you like. And many philosophers talk about reaching the limits of language. In Rumi also uh, you'll hear that there are experiences you cannot express in language. So maybe we are also getting there. And third one is very pragmatic. You need to maybe relate it to the first one. You need to know how to speak actually uh, in order to be safe and sound. Uh, because he's talking about getting uh, in trouble, uh, yeah, getting burned. And what does he mean by that? Actually, people were put uh, on fire, burned, uh, or impaled, hanged, tortured for advocating such a Sufi type of thinking. So he's saying you need to be careful. If you are not wise, you can get into this type of trouble and you don't need to be like that. So let's go to the uh, highest gate, which is the truth, Katika. And the people are mocking, friends or lovers, and they are made of earth. And uh, that uh, point is that they have a direct access to the knowledge of God and it is not if you like uh, indirect as in the case of Arabs, uh, they know through a kind of knowledge, through language, it, even if it is a strange language, looking inside uh, through their uh, self-knowledge they know God and uh, they know themselves by understanding God. There is a kind of virtuous circularity there. I believe mean, that is uh, all uh, I wanted to say. And I have couplets from, uh, uh, from uh, Yunus Emre, we are going uh, to get uh, to know. And uh, he uh, puts in uh, perspective Sharia Tariqat, paths for those determined to walk, Marifayt Hakikat, this go deeper than path, a path. And then he explains each gate uh, in a couplet. Translations are very really, uh, rough, but just to give the idea. Uh, setting the context for the uh, geography, this is the uh, today's uh, uh, Turkey, uh, as we know it. And uh, we are going to see the majority uh, of the events will be happening in this uh, region, most, mostly uh, Konya and uh, uh, Eastern part, Konya, as you may know, was the capital uh, of the Seljuks and uh, the residence of uh, Rumi. So this is uh, the, the uh, overlay uh, of the events. Uh, what I would like to call, I, I am not going to go uh, through all uh, those things, Terrible things were happening during this period. Mongols were coming in, uh, sacking a city. Masai Prince gave one, uh, defeating an army, and then pulling back. Uh, sometimes getting defeated, coming back for the uh, for the revenge. And for each uh, date, you would see more or less a, a, a date uh, in, in the geography, so that uh, you can map. Uh, one interesting uh, uh, event is Baba Babae Isyan or uh, rebellion. It happens around uh, this was an uh, uh, Tokat uh, region. Uh, a group of uh, 
villagers, if you like, ordinary people, under the leadership of uh, a so certain Baba Isya uh, rebels uh, against Seljuks, and they defeat actually the official army, and then uh, the mercenaries of Seljuks defeats them, and you can imagine uh, a, a terrible uh, massacre. And uh, the reason why I, I am mentioning that uh, both uh, uh, Haji Bektaş Veli as well as uh, Yunus Emre are uh, considered to be uh, their uh, affiliate. Here you have uh, some major events uh, of the history. Uh, blue uh, looking ones are uh, maybe political events, uh, green looking ones are uh, spiritual religious events. And uh, here you have the highlights of Yunus Emre we are going to talk about. And we know for all practical uh, 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 purposes, nothing about this life. Uh, actually, we know some legends here which are very uh, charming. Uh, I wish I could spend the rest of the lecture to talk about it, but uh, I'll try to refrain it. Uh, his journey starts by meeting Haji Bektaş, and he becomes uh, the student of a certain top to Kemre. And uh, there are many uh, romance uh, stories and uh, surreal events. Uh, toward uh, the end of his life, uh, his encounter uh, Romy and uh, challenges him. He says, you write very bad, but you write uh, too long. I could have said uh, what you said in uh, so many volumes in a question and so on. So it is the legend, so you can But you know, uh, the, the roommate also said uh, to his uh, surrounding, uh, he said, you know, I have been uh, at uh, different uh, spiritual peaks. Wherever I was in a new uh, place I went, I saw the footsteps of a Turkish villager, if you like. He meant uh, Rumi, so he recognized, uh, I'm sorry, he meant Yunus and Rek. So he recognized that uh, Yunus was really uh, something uh, uh, exceptional. So this is a, a technique uh, I, I came across. It is called a poem itself. Rather than trying to have an artistic translation, I have one at the bottom. Uh, you can read it. I give the basic uh, linguistic elements of it. Uh, we we'll read uh, in Turkish, and then uh, you you get a uh, direct sense uh, for it. <coughs> so the poem reads, Aşkın aldı benden beni, bana seni gerek seni. Ben yanarım günü günü, bana seni gerek seni. Ne varlığa sevinirim, ne yokluğa yerinirim. Aşkın ile kavunurum, bana seni gerek seni. Kalem, bu türlü de. Turkish. Aşkın aldı benden beni, bana seni gerek seni. Ben yanarım düğünü günü, bana seni gerek seni. Ne varlığa sevinirim, ne yokluğa yerinirim. Aşkın ile avunurum, bana seni gerek seni. So the, the whole core of this uh, poem can be summarized by this uh, pronouns, in particular uh, the first part. In Turkish uh, there is no gender. Uh, problem, so it is uh, uh, in the pronouns uh, we don't have uh, that type of uh, distinction and no uh, preposition uh, of the, we, we have a kind of conjugation that should be a technical term for this, but uh, if I would be Ben, uh, to me would be Bene, mine would be Benim, to me, Bana Bene, and those are the counterpart for uh, the second person. And notice also in Turkish uh, we have the French or German uh, singular second forms uh, to address God in the second person singular. You don't have to be ceremonial to be, you can talk to God as if you were talking to a God. Yeah. So those are the basics we are going to see here. Ash Benalde Benden Beni. Ash is also, I believe, in Farsi, yeah, Ash. Uh, love. And in that case, would be Bandan Bini. Your love took from me, me. Uh, to me, uh, what I need, 
let me give the basic uh, meaning. What I need is you, only you. To me, you needed you. Ben yanarım günü günü. Yeah. I am burning yesterday and today. And the repetition. Ne varlığa yevinirim, ne yokluğa e, yerinirim, sevinirim, yerinirim. Aşkın ile alınırım, bana seni gereksene. So, in that case, uh, uh, he plays a, a game with varlık and yokluk. He's saying, I am not uh, fond of the varlık, and varlık may mean two things, existence on the one hand, and it may also mean uh, prosperity. And the opposite of it, I don't care or worry about yokluk. Yokluk uh, means uh, non-existence or uh, poverty. Aşkın ile alınırım. I console myself with your love. What I need is you, only you. And Talat Said Harman, the professor, uh, has a full-fledged uh, uh, translation of this two quatrains. But the difference to me is uh, Yunus, in this case, wrote uh, in syllabic with uh, eight syllables, uh, with uh, pause in, in four. So if uh, my arithmetic uh, is correct, uh, we have uh, 48 syllables in this uh, poem. And uh, I don't know how many we would find uh, in the English translation, but uh, this conciseness and the power of things he is expressing uh, is quite uh, amazing. And the rhyme scheme uh, is also very simple, and he is uh, using half uh, rhymes. Yeah. Beni günü sevinirim, yenilirim, avunurum, and we have refrain. So it is a very simple but quite a powerful poem. I hope you are getting a sense of it. And I have also as a song I have been playing with the beginning. So first of all, so this is an essay, I am not going to read it, but I mean to say here is the following. I don't mean this uh, presentation or uh, study is a uh, historical uh, study. My, uh, I, I uh, call my approach uh, with the fancy uh, uh, resonance hermeneutic. Hermeneutics being the study of uh, text written uh, speech, if you like, mostly. Uh, and I put resonance, that means I, uh, I like us to look to a written text, not in order to establish its, uh, if you like, historical veracity, but to be able to create a, a personal relationship, reading a historical poem, as if it were a poem written today, to be able to enjoy uh, in that form. And uh, with the same to token, approaching a philosophical or spiritual text in the same way, whether we can learn uh, things from them. So the resonance, the echo, is uh, my uh, general idea and goal. So uh, here, uh, what I try to do is, uh, I take samples from uh, uh, Yunus's uh, uh, poems, and uh, one of the issues uh, scholars are dealing with, they are not uh, all saying the same thing. Of course, there is a problem. How many of those are authentic Yunus points? But uh, this problem aside, how do we explain uh, those variations? The gimmick I am using is, uh, I am <coughs> approaching them as if he had written group of peoples for peoples who were aligned with a gate. So some poems are for wind people, some poems are for fire people, and so on and so forth. So these uh, are uh, poems uh, which are for Sharia people or uh, wind people. Ayyaranlar, Ayşat, kardeşler, korkarım ben ölem değil. Öldüğümü kayırmazam, ettiğimi bulan değil. So the interesting part of, of this poem is that it is very uh, direct. In uh, today parlance, we, we say it is a very uh, authoritative tone. Not authoritative in the sense of, if you like, teacherly, but uh, you, you seem to think he is really talking to you at this moment. So uh, he says, my friends, my uh, uh, brothers, I am really fearful of dying. He's saying in a very simple way, 
And he adds, it is not uh, that it is frightening me, but I am going to be punished for the things I have done. So again, very, very direct. And Ittina uh, Bulmak gives a very uh, contemporary expression. Yeah? To get what one is uh, served. Yeah. And then uh, he writes uh, some poems I consider uh, uh, meaning to distill some terrible uh, uh, fear into the soul uh, of the uh, audience. So in these poems he reads, uh, uh, he talks about uh, the, the corpse in the tombs uh, or what is it going to happen as what type of punishment we are going to get uh, in uh, afterlife. He is quite skillful in uh, describing those things in uh, gruesome uh, detail. So in my uh, angle, those are really the type of thing you would expect uh, the wind people uh, to worry about. But I would like to make the qualification up front. Yunus Emre is famous uh, for his gentleness, for humanitarianism, compassion, humanism even in some kind. And if you look to the other example I give, in his way of writing and thinking, uh, the well feeling of a fellow human being is so much important than all other uh, religious uh, spiritual consideration. So those are uh, really rather exception than the rule in his uh, way of writing. But we find a series of those poems that are really uh, fear enticing. These are five poems. In that case, uh, the group of poems we can associate with uh, people who are uh, becoming a person of caricat and uh, burning, being on fire uh, was uh, a, a trend uh, among those people. This the first uh, quotation I have, Ben Yuru Yana Yana, I walk uh, in fire, so there is fire, and uh, there is love, so those are uh, really uh, uh, poems addressing uh, that gate of uh, fire. And uh, we are also seeing some poems describing or talking about issues of being a member of a uh, tarikat, uh, of a tekke, being a dervish. And I also uh, uh, group those poems under this category of fire. And uh, there are uh, some interesting examples. One example is in the middle, uh, where he talks uh, to a, a instrument, actually two instruments, yeah, Kopuz and Cheshte, and uh, he is asking, what are you made of? And they reply some kind, I, I am made of uh, uh, wood, and my strings are uh, certain pieces of uh, animals. And uh, this is an interesting tradition in Turkish uh, uh, literature, Shaitan Sazan Neresin, the very uh, Satan in, in my in instrument. The point is that uh, some establishment traditionalists maybe uh, were criti criticizing those people, saying that your instrument is an instrument of Satan. And they are, if you like, denying, saying that this is just a, 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 a wooden instrument where it would be anything satanic in it. <coughs> And in the last uh, 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 couplet, he also engaged Rumi, Mevlana, so in the Sazili, Ishret, old Ishret. So apparently, in the uh, meetings of uh, Rumi, yeah, Mevlana is the name we use usually in Turkish for Rumi, there was uh, some uh, music and maybe even some uh, alcohol uh, consumption. And this is the type of things that makes the establishment rather a little uh, angry about those people. And the point is that when we reach these people, it is very different from what we had uh, in the previous game, where strictness, yeah? black and white, moral consideration were the primary. Here, there is a, a room for, if you like, earthly enjoyment. Uh, this one talks about what does it take uh, to become a, a dervish, but this poem here is uh, very interesting. 
He talks about uh, being a dervish, a Sufi, if you like, is an act of grace, Balashtanmak, yeah? And uh, he gives a list of things, and uh, the tense of the language is a little maybe uh, confusing. Uh, in the uh, contemporary Turkish, Gümüşlene, Balashtana, Işlene, all those uh, uh, tense sounds like uh, wish, wishes, there is uh, some uh, readers I, I have seen interpret this as uh, uh, general uh, present tense. So in those, if we read uh, with this uh, grammatical understanding, in this case, those are the characteristics of a Turkish. Or if we understand with the today's uh, Turkish grammar, they, those would be more wishes he makes uh, to a Sufi. Uh, the interesting part is that he starts by saying uh, his heart uh, became uh, become uh, pure and uh, silver, if you like, and then in his uh, essence, uh, certain uh, beautiful sense uh, start uh, emanating. Then all of a sudden he switched in his branch, yeah, uh, town and cities uh, flourish, and then. Uh, he, said, he talks about his uh, leaves, yeah? Under his leaves, uh, or his leaves became a, a medicine uh, to the sick ones. In his shadows, uh, good things uh, happen. And uh, the, the, the lover starts uh, crying so that there is a, a lake uh, around uh, him. And then there are uh, uh, sars, uh, yeah, the, the, the bushes, reeds uh, becomes, and and so on and so forth. Uh, the interesting aspect is that uh, slowly the dervish, the Sufi, uh, changes into a tree, and he makes uh, this transition so uh, subtly. Uh, the reader. Uh, seems to experience a uh, metamorphosis, not just a metaphor saying that I look at the dervish and I see uh, a tree, but he kind of uh, talks about a magical change. Maybe by becoming a dervish, one changes, if you like, uh, his or uh, her nature. And uh, certain scholars, and it is really typical uh, to relate to uh, Turkish or Anatolian Sufism sees uh, some uh, pagan, uh, if you like, uh, uh, inheritance in this way of uh, thinking where in particular worshipping of time was very uh, dominant and Ilhan Bakçköz uh, is uh, saying maybe he is taking Sufi thinking and overlays on top of it a uh, 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 Turkic uh, Paganic uh, heritage. So it's quite interesting. Water. Uh, in water points, that is the uh, points uh, I uh, group as water points. Uh, the main themes are uh, knowledge and language, yeah, or place on the language. So one of the uh, most famous uh, points uh, starts like ilmi ilim bilmektir, ilim kendin bilmektir, sen kendini bilmezsin yani okumaktır. So this is a, a, a Poem uh, difficult to translate into uh, English. Ilim actually uh, means science, but science in uh, English is this association of natural or positive science. Whereas, if it were German, Wissenschaft in German is free of that association. So he talks about in this way knowledge or science. Science, ilim bilmektir. So science is to know science. Knowledge is to know knowledge. No, knowledge is to know oneself. And there is still really an epistemic uh, sophistication. Uh, he is saying, in order something to be a knowledge, the knowledge uh, needs to be reflected. We cannot know without knowing. And we need to know what a knowledge is in order to say that we know something. So although written in a very simple language, if we look from the perspective of uh, contemporary things like epistemic logic, we see really uh, some uh, 
hints uh, toward it. Uh, moving to the next uh, quatrains, uh, we find also a, a quite amazing uh, words here. Dört kitabın manası belli bir bir elif de sen elifi bilmezsin bu nece, nice okumaktır. So, the meaning of four <coughs> books uh, in, in the uh, Islam uh, tradition, uh, we believe that there were three, uh, four holy books, uh, starting with uh, uh, Psalms, yeah, this one, Zabur, uh, and then Torah, Bible, and Quran. Those are all uh, legitimate, accepted holy books, and each revealed uh, to a specific uh, prophets prophet and uh, he talks about those four books and mana is something which is very specific to the scale. So the meaning of these four books is clear in Elif. <coughs> so we need to understand what Elif is. Elif is a woman's name. Yeah? It is a, a, a poem written by a completely different type of, uh, uh, of uh, poet of the folk tradition where he says in Cicik'ten bir kar yağar tozar elif elif diye deli günü de aptal olmuş gezer elif elif diye so it snows with fragile slaves chanting o oh, elif my elif my poor heart is a traveler now wonders elif o oh, elif my elif so maybe this fellow is in love so he is thinking about his uh, beloved or is it also uh, love of God uh, is he talking about? And this is a game we are going to find with all mystics, not only Sufis or Muslims, but also Christians and Jewish, where the, this, uh, this uh, ambiguity, if you like, and some philosophers such Henry Bergson, Bergson uh, believed that actual romance, the carnal love, was uh, established by the literatures and lingu uh, language of uh, uh, mystic uh, uh, people we took over and made them worldly. But what is this Elif? Elif is the first letter yeah, of uh, Arabic or Ottoman uh, language and because of its shape uh, it represents uh, unity. So in all those uh, books the main message is the unity of God, the monotheism of those Abrahamic uh, religions. If you don't understand and you lose yourself in the details of stories of moral uh, prescriptions, you are missing the point. This is what he is saying. And it is also, of course, it is, uh, the first name, the, the first letter of Allah. And uh, the last quatrain here is also very typical, and in this tradition of folk and also divine, the royal uh, poetry, uh, the poet is expected to mention his name in the last couplet of quatrain. Yunus says to you, Oja, it need be made thousand hundred matches, uh, but the best deed of all is to please a human heart. So again, very different from the, uh, the, the first uh, Shariat uh, case where he was saying, in order to have in your chest faith, you need to have all those ritualistic external stuff. And here he is saying, you can go a thousand times uh, to Hajj, to pilgrimage, but if you are not being nice to someone, it is not good in God's sight. Uh, the other poem I have uh, included here is uh, very open to interpretation and uh, discussion. It is a nonsensical point. It doesn't make sense. It is almost uh, surreal. As you can see, he climbs uh, to plum tree, uh, but he ate their uh, grapes. Then the owner of the uh, orchard comes, and he is angry why he is eating the hazelnuts. Then he sees an eagle and fly uh, wrestling, and he is saying, I really see this. And at the end he says, uh, what type of language is this? Münafıklar elinden örter mana yüzünü. The last two uh, maybe is a little bit fugitive meanings escape the blind eyes of those who are ignorant, if you like. Uh, this goes back to the language of uh, 
has big touch where he was seeing the front and back. So he is giving us a point in, in front of the words, uh, uh, and maybe there is a back end. Or maybe saying, look, for those who are ignorant, the speech of those who are wise, this is how you hear it. Just an illustration. Mm. So there is nothing to understand behind it, but just to experience it, if you like, the story. Finally, third point. Uh, I said that uh, uh, maybe in the first example we analyze Ashkenal the bit and then when it was a syllabic eight, uh, eight uh, syllables. He wrote also in the other quantitative method, Arus, and here we have a eleven uh, syllable. Uh, Couplets, mother. But uh, the interesting part uh, is the stops are at, at different uh, places. In first case, you stop after six. In the second uh, verse, you stop after uh, four. Uh, this is where uh, actually uh, we see the whole uh, if you like position of Yunus according to whole uh, this business of religion and uh, spirituality. Severin Benson in Chandan Chile. Yolun bitmez bu erkenden içeri. My love for you comes from a place deeper than my soul. This is what I try to jamming. Yeah? What gives me the love? Yolun bitmez bu erkenden içeri. But he says, uh, I love you so much, which is much deeper than my self-love. But my way, the way I live, the way I behave, is nothing to do with the ways it is prescribed in the traditional ways. Dini terk edilen küfürdür işi, bu ne küfürdür imandan içeri. So yes, uh, quitting uh, religion is some kind of blasphemy, but I am uh, committing uh, blasphemy, which is much deeper than any faith. And then he says, geçerken Yunus şeş oldu dostlar, kaldı kapıda andan içeri. So, at the end, Yunus became one uh, with the friend, but he stayed in front of a gate, a gate which is deeper than inside. So that is, in, in a sense, his criticism of the whole theory, saying that at the end we may be reaching a place where, which is beyond those whole uh, discussion about gates. <coughs> Uh, the second uh, uh, poem uh, I included is also uh, quite uh, famous. Uh, the worshipping of the people of earth was imploration. Uh, it is also called uh, minajat, as a, a, a poetical genre where one is to implore, beg God for mercy and so on. And uh, his poem under uh, this category, this genre, is very opposite of it. He is questioning. He is very defined uh, against God. Uh, he is saying, uh, you are going to uh, ask me questions sometime, maybe on the other side. Uh, if I made some uh, torture, uh, bad things, I did to myself. I didn't do anything to you. Even uh, I was born, you called me evil or bad. You told me even before uh, being born, uh, that I was a, 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 a rebel. So he is actually living uh, uh, original sin, saying that this original sin doesn't make sense to me. And if, uh, the responsibility you are putting on my shoulders do not make sense to me, because you are my maker. And I have, even if I made uh, done things which are not good, I didn't uh, do anything to you. All those things were to myself. So, what is the purpose of questioning? And then he, he goes, uh, even, uh, what is it that I steal from you? Did I uh, leave you hungry? And uh, you didn't have enough vengeance at the end, uh, you killed me and put uh, under the earth with uh, earth covering all my eyes and so on. And I find also this interesting. He talks about the bridge. So, in the Muslim folklore, in particular, we are supposed to go across a bridge as thin as a hair, 
and uh, at the bottom of the bridge there are flames so if you are a sinful person uh, your destiny uh, wouldn't be a good end you couldn't end it and he, he challenges saying that what type of engineer are you what type of construction <laughs> is this when we build bridges it means uh, for the people to go through it and uh, why is that so he doesn't see the purpose of, of it. The challenge uh, in my mind uh, to interpret uh, this poem, why uh, in particular I do you see as an earth poem? Because this is a, a quite conflict-oriented, uh, questioning, uh, rebellious uh, 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 poem. Uh, I have two, uh, if you like, points about uh, this stage. One is this type of conflict can only happen among uh, friends. Or after having this type of conflict, you can be really a good friend with someone. So he is not a friend with God. For that reason, he can have this type of conflict. And I like also to say the love he is talking here, and he is using the term of those friend, is very different than the love uh, we were talking uh, in the in the second uh, tarikat where it was uh, passionate being in in fire yeah. so this is serene friendship a more mature way of uh, uh, of love you get uh, if the, after 45 years of marriage <laughs> <laughs> So those are the resources. The only correction I would like to make, if it's okay, is self promotion. Uh, my dictionary is actually English, not Turkish. So it is uh, written for English-speaking people. Mm -hmm. Although the terms to, to be defined as uh, Turkish, the definitions are in English, and it is an extracted dictionary. <laughs> so I'll give the conclusions uh, to you, and maybe if you have questions, I answer uh, the question. Thank you very much for coming and listening. Yeah. Now about the dervishes. Do you think the dervish is a stage that one reaches after mm -hmm. a certain level? Right? Yeah. So a dervish does not necessarily have to be a whirling dervish. That's yes. another. Okay. Yeah. Now, on the uh, Berlin Dervish are uh, the followers of uh, Rumi yeah, yeah. Okay. and commercialized from yeah. Now, on the uh, earth poems, yeah. you say there is a couplet here, Sever Bansing John Lanichir, translated, My love for you comes from a face deeper than my soul. Yeah. Now, something that's in the language at all times, John yeah. Lanichir, yeah. how would you translate that? Yeah. So this is a term, uh, yeah. someone we know is using all the time, Jeremy uh, This is very much related to it, so Chan is very difficult. Uh, is this also Persian, I believe, Chan? Yeah. So it is, Chan uh, is living being, so it is the very principle of a person. And Jeremy Nietzsche means you are something more uh, valuable uh, than uh, my uh, insight. That makes me a different thing. Okay? okay? There are some words like Jan, Gunil, yeah, which are uh, difficult to translate because of their multiple connotations. And one last question. Uh, I thought that, but probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it says, uh, you said, uh, at this stage, the uh, earth point state, on the first, the yeah. fourth stage, that you reach a certain level where a complete uh, friend of God. Yeah. Now that uh, is reached uh, only after conflicts. Is that, the, do I understand the, that? Or mm, at least yeah. conflicts go in there for the state of true friendship to exist? That was my life uh, experience. All the good friends I made, uh, made through <laughs> after the, the conflict. So uh, I generalized, uh, thought that he, maybe he had also the same experience. Yeah. Yeah.
think the conflict is uh, in going through the stages, as you already yeah. noticed, that uh, the love in Hakikat is different from the love yeah. in Tarika. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and in the rendition of these gates, I wanted to ask specifically with the change uh, with Hajibat Tashbali yeah. putting Marifat ahead of Hakikat, with Hakikat yeah. being the highest yes. gate. Yes. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, it's a question that I'm dealing with my own research with the Bekhashis in Albania, yeah. where I have not yet arrived at the conclusion as to how to put these gates in an order. Mm -hmm. uh, up, to, up to the third stage, okay, with yeah. the Shariat and the Tarikat, but then whether the Marifet comes before the Hakikat mm -hmm. or the Hakikat before Marifet yeah. or whether these yeah. two have more of a yeah. unison together. Yeah. I want to know what yeah. you say from your studies. Uh, what, uh, what logic behind yeah. this change? Uh, I found a uh, similar uh, discussion in, in the different writings, but uh, this was uh, my take in, in terms of uh, Yisevi's. Uh, Expressions. He comes uh, in this uh, couplet, uh, in this order. Yeah, Sharia, Tarika, Marifet, Hakika, Sharia, Sus, Tarika, the Gechemele. I couldn't go to Tarika before going through uh, Sharia, and I couldn't go to Marifet through going to Hakika. I mean, that is your point. He is not saying I couldn't go to Marifet uh, without going to uh, through Tarika. Hmm. Interesting point. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to move this. But do you think uh, there is an evolution uh, in comparison to Tarika in Marfa and uh, Whatever their orders, if we can assume that. Now I am coming back with an argument. Yeah. So although he says those are the relationships, yeah, dependencies, you cannot go to Sharia. Uh, you cannot go to Tariqat without going through Sharia. And you cannot go to Marifa without going to Harikat. So it, for him, these are the orders, first of all. Yeah, Sharia means obey the rules. I mean, if you don't yeah. obey the rules, how can yeah. you go further? Yeah. But how do we go from Tarika to the next level? Uh, this is uh, the, the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, bir karşılaştırma ve bir derecelendirme yok dediniz ya işte o, o noktadan öyle dediniz değil mi? Ya, yanlış anlamadım. Ee, belki de e, benim dediğim şuydu hı hı. bu o, şeye bakarsak bir de gösterdiği şey tarikatla şeriat marif, marifet ve hakikat arasında bağlantı var. Bağlantı var ama derecelendirme yok. Yani biri birinden e, daha olmadan olmaz. Hani burada bir daha kullanılıyor ama benim evet. anladığım yani şeriatta kalmak insanın insanlaşmasına çok katkıda bulunmuyor. Evet. Ama burada benim okuyuşumla yani bir geçiş var. Transition. Yeah. So you can not go to tarika without going to şeria. Yani there is an order. And then there is also a order between the two. Hakikat and marifet. <laughs> but what we don't see that is the argument between this two mm -hmm. or between this level. <coughs> and I think here the word Sharia is not the way we understand it today in the sense of right. uh, Quranic Sharia. Mm -hmm. This is a, a book of rules or, or, or system. Sharia yeah, yeah, is the first the condition to be a good citizen. Right, <coughs> right. In other words, you know, we don't have to think about it in the, uh, the Quranic Sharia rules. I think. <laughs> I still sense there is definitely a, 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 a level of distinction between uh, uh, whatever, Hakikat, Marife, and uh, this two. Because we get definitely to a level of knowledge uh, which we cannot find here. Even the uh, language uh, is changing. So my I don't mean to say that Bektaş or Lisebi meant in that way, there is a change. 
And if you uh, uh, ask my uh, sense, uh, I believe Hakikat should come uh, as the last one between the two, uh, because I see uh, Marifa being uh, still uh, indirect, if you like, through knowledge, uh, thinking, cerebral. There is in Hakikat, there is an immediacy. It is knowing through knowing oneself, uh, which is uh, if you think of Descartes, which is the most intuitive and strong uh, form of knowledge. So, I had a bit of argument, but it uh, flew away, maybe it will come back. Yeah. If, if I could uh, just follow up, uh, we have the change then from the ESRB teachings, uh, sort of from the Hakikat, yeah. then you go to the Marifat, the change with Ajib Akhtash, the Marifat being sort of, and then Hakikat, it makes sense in this yeah. Uh, because Hakikat, the truth or yeah. union with God, the goal of mysticism yeah. is knowing God, yeah. so it makes sense that that is at the highest yeah. uh, level of this hierarchy. Uh, but uh, th th there is that also the uh, once you achieve this mm -hmm. union with God, then you also the return, then the, yeah. the Sufi return, and the obligation to also teach yeah. others how to reach yeah. there. Uh, what that is is actually the way the yeah. Marifet. Yeah. So that you know uh, mm -hmm. the secrets of, mm -hmm. of, of things, of the existence mm -hmm. of the world. Okay. So yeah. So in, in that case, uh, if we take, for example, uh, Yunus's uh, life, after spending 40 years with his uh, shape teacher, Taktu, he starts wonder and uh, reading his, his poem, explains those uh, to the other people. But uh, uh, in that case, it is like. Uh, uh, I would say uh, it is more like becoming a consultant rather than going to the Hakikat. Graduating from uh, uh, Tarikat and having enough knowledge yeah, uh, to be able to explain to others. Uh, maybe uh, the people who are teaching to others are not, uh, if you like, uh, the, the people who reach the Hakikat, except the people, maybe the sheikhs in the tech game, yeah? I'm unclear if there is a yeah, obligation, once you reach the uh, level of habitat, if there is an obligation to teach others yeah. how to reach that. I thought that uh, there's no such thing as proselytizing, yeah. but the yeah. only thing that you can do is by setting an example of your own life, in other words, yeah. the way you live yeah. your own life. Now, is that correct? Yeah, Th that is also uh, my uh, personal uh, reading. Historically, that may not be the case. Actually, uh, with Hakikat, the major difference from the previous stage, uh, knowledge is that it is a, a, a stage of integration. Your knowledge becomes part of your existence, living and, uh, if you like, acting. Uh, this is one. And the second aspect is that uh, uh, we shouldn't consider Hakikat uh, in our uh, contemporary sense as a nirvana, but if you like, uh, the, uh, the start of a new uh, uh, spiral, uh, rather than looking at this at four, if you like, phases, it is more of a evolving spiral. So there is no uh, uh, stopping at the fourth game, but uh, because after a certain while, the hakikat of a certain uh, period may or uh, in all likelihood would become a sharia and you need to go to go beyond. Maybe this is a, a personal choice. Uh, it is not so much uh, the teaching, but learning to me is more important. For that reason, the search of hakikat is really a personal journey. When you start uh, trying to teach uh, to other people, like giving a lecture like that, <coughs> then you are in the wrong for that Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I just wanted to know if there is any historical evidence that Archie Fertash and Yunus Emre had met Rumi or they were aware of each other? <coughs> yeah, uh, there is that legend uh, where uh, uh, Yunus is going through a famine uh, in Anatolia and they don't have anything uh, to eat. He, he collects some wild uh, apples or uh, plums and wandering around, he comes uh, coincidentally to a lodge 
which happens to be backlash, and they uh, keep him for a couple of days, and then he tries to make a barter. He would like to get some seeds, and backlash refuses. He says, "But if instead of seeds, I were to give you some blessings?" And he says, "Oh, I don't want any blessings. You have blessings, <laughs> but cannot feed oneself." Yeah, and there is a negotiation. And, it, and he gets a lot of seeds and starts going back and then he realizes, oh, what I have done, this is a holy man. Surely there should have been something good in the blessings. He goes back and what Ekta says, too late. Uh, your life was given, is given to talk to, to a certain talk to, in order to unlock yourself, you need to find this talk to and take your journey. So this is uh, basically, uh, the basis in which we associate uh, Yunus with the Dash. But he, he, some claims he is also associated with Babai's over yeah, re rebellious. Yeah. Uh, was, was he born in Orasan or Anatolia? Or Bektash? Uh, according to the legends, he was born uh, in uh, Khorasan or in yeah. Central Asia, and he came as a white dog flying to Anatolia. And he was uh, received by ugly uh, red, uh, black eagles who didn't want to let him go, but uh, he managed to go through, but he was uh, terribly wounded. And he fell in a small village, and an old lady took care of him. And this is the proof that woman is a very prominent place in the establishment of the Tashi tradition. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.